And Ian, the big story that we're tracking on Beyond this morning. Now, we all know that the Indian LVM-3 rocket carried Chandrayaan-3 into the space. Thereafter, the craft has been propelling itself to the moon. The craft is barely hours from landing on the moon. Right, and now the question is, what's the science behind such precise travel for millions of kilometers in space? How are such missions executed flawlessly without any collisions in space? In this report, our senior correspondent Siddharth MP tells us more. The rocket liftoff is the most spectacular moment of a space mission. It's a stunning moment of audiovisual brilliance. The flame, the smoke trail, the engines roaring and the vehicle flying. However, once the rocket does its job and the craft is injected into the orbit, do we know what happens next? The spacecraft is on its own. It has to move through thousands of other satellites around the Earth. It has to steer its way through space, perform its functions, fire its engines, operate its sensors and what not. How does it all happen? Did you know that there are an entire branch of engineers and scientists handling this function? This science is known as spacecraft mission operations. It's a behind-the-scenes activity. Space agencies world over have large antennae at various vantage locations. These antennae are used by the operations personnel to communicate with faraway spacecraft that are thousands to millions of miles away from Earth. Operating spacecrafts involves making precise calculations, predictions and even multiple backup plans. For a lunar mission like Chandrayaan-3, this whole operation becomes highly sophisticated. From the time India's Chandrayaan-3 spacecraft entered Earth's orbit, it's been ISRO's tracking telemetry and command network facility here in Bengaluru that's been steering the craft towards its lunar soft landing. It's the mission operations team here at ISTRAC that are the unsung heroes and those that are performing this lesser known activity known as spacecraft mission operations. They issue commands to the craft, they monitor its health, they steer it and they also ensure that it reaches its destination safely and can perform its operations there as intended. With video journalist Chandra Shekhar from Bengaluru, Siddharth MP, we on World is One. Now, to discuss this further on today's lunar landing, we also have uh, Vion Senior Correspondent Siddharth MP also joining us live from Bengaluru. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Siddharth. It's a big day for India. I'd say a big question here is, will Prime Minister Modi be witnessing this historic event from the BRICS Summit in Johannesburg? Yeah, of course. Uh, good morning to you. So this is a historic day, as you rightly mentioned, and Prime Minister Narendra Modi will be witnessing this event from Johannesburg. In fact, what we are also hearing from sources is that the PM is expected to address ISRO this evening, shortly after the lunar landing happens and shortly after Chairman ISRO Dr. S. Somnath delivers his post-success address. So we're given to understand that there will be a direct video link established between the BRICS summit venue in Johannesburg where Prime Minister Modi is and also the ISTRAC facility in Bengaluru which will be the nerve center of all the action today. So video link will be established and the Prime Minister we're told is also expected to deliver an address uh, to the ISRO team that has executed this mission. Let's remember ISRO is a team of 20,000 people spread across India. They've worked on this mission. So it will be a great moment when the Indian Prime Minister, the direct minister in charge of space and science and technology sort of speaks to them and addresses them after the mission and after the success. To give you more context, the Indian Prime Minister was here in 2019 as well at ISTRAC as Chandrayaan 2 attempted its lunar soft landing. And when that did not happen, the Prime Minister delivered an address. You know, he addressed the ISRO scientists and told them that we can always have one more go at it. And this is what space science and technology is about, that you learn from your mistakes and do it again. And four years later, we are on that historic location. Absolutely, Siddharth. We are just a few hours away from the lunar surface landing. And like moon, uh, manned moon missions have historically been prevalent, but uh, Chandrayaan-3 being an unmanned mission, what exactly is ISTRO trying to achieve with this mission?
So when we look at the manned moon missions, the Apollo program began in 1969 and it went on well into 1972. So there were missions between Apollo 11 and Apollo 17 carried out between three years. 14 astronauts had landed on the moon. But let's remember that when a man landed on the moon, the Neil Armstrong and that entire batch of astronauts when they landed on the moon in phases, they landed near the equator of the moon. And that time, moon was a planet that uh, the world had very little awareness about. There was only a theoretical understanding. It was only by sending spacecrafts one after the other that they understood the moon. And of course, the technology at that time was so uh, primitive or it was so in its nascent stage. For example, it is said by NASA itself that the computer which powered Apollo 11 back then is much weaker than the smartphones we carry in our pockets today. So that was the technology back then, so there were limitations. And they explored only the equatorial region of the moon at that point in time. But today what's happening is ISRO is going to the southern pole of the moon. ISRO's Chandrayaan-3 craft is going to the not-so-explored southern pole polar region of the moon. So no crafts have landed in the southern polar region. Russia's Luna 25-2 was supposed to land at the southern polar region earlier this week, but that mission did not materialize. It crash landed. But ISRO is attempting to be the first to be able to land a craft on the southern polar region, which is expected to ha harbor a lot of ice deposits, water ice deposits, which could be crucial for humankind. And let's remember that uh, uh, unmanned missions are crucial because before going to some place which is extremely hazardous and unknown, you go there unmanned using a robo. And once the robo tells you that everything is safe, you can always send man, and which is precisely why in two years from now, there will be the Artemis manned missions where America will put man and woman back on the moon. Well, Siddharth, thank you so much for getting us the latest on this. Of course, we'll be continuing to track the developments through the day. Moving on now, also joining us on the show is Mr. Arup Das Gupta, who is the former Deputy Director ISRO to further understand the Chandrayaan mission. Sir, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you very much for having me. Sir, my first question to you, what can you tell us of the crucial final stages before the Chandrayaan-3 attempts to land on the moon? Well, there are eight stages uh, which are there. Uh, the first stage is where uh, we are, uh, the craft will be breaking. It's called the rough breaking phase. And that's where the speed of the craft is going to come down from 6,000 uh, kilometers per second to about 1,200 kilometers per second. <clears throat> All four uh, thrusters will be used. And the height will come down from about 30 kilometers to about 7.4 kilometers. At this point, it will uh, come into the second stage. And at the second stage, uh, two things are going to happen. One is that the Chandrayaan, which was so far flying with its uh, legs horizontal to the moon surface, will now turn around to roughly about 59 degrees. Uh, and will be, uh, and uh, these uh, further uh, the speed will come down and it will come down to about 6.8 kilometers. This is called the attitude hold phase <coughs> where it will, it will steady itself for the landing. Then comes the fine braking phase where the speed and the height will further reduce and uh, now only two of the thrusters will be firing out of the four and uh, it will come down to about uh, 800 meters and until virtually the speed will come down to zero, the forward speed, and it will be literally hovering over the moon. Uh, at, this, at, at, the, at the fourth stage, uh, it, the, the craft will come down to roughly about 150 meters. And uh, then what it will be doing is it will be looking at down uh, through its uh, cameras and aligning itself to the position it should have been based on the uh, data, the, the pictures that have already been fed into the uh, spacecraft. Once it looks and it decides that it's on the right track, then it will slowly come down to 60 meters. And then from 60 meters, uh, it will come down to 10 meters. And at 10 meters, literally like a feather, is going to come down onto the moon's surface at a speed which will not be more than three meters per second. So once it has landed, uh, it will wait for three hours for anything else to happen because the landing process itself will pick up a lot of moon dust and it will have to wait for the moon dust to settle down before it can do anything further. Right, sir. Also shed some light on, on what basis will the Vikram lander select its landing spot? Yeah, uh, actually what has been done is that there is an area which has been earmarked which is roughly I think about 2 kilometers by about 4 kilometers. 
so once it reaches uh, and once it reaches that area uh, the pictures the high resolution pictures of that area which were taken by chandrayaan 2 uh, which is the uh, carrying one of the highest resolution cameras which has ever gone to the moon so it will it will take to it will be looking at those pictures and comparing it in real time with the pictures that uh, it is seeing from its own camera and that's the way it will decide whether where it is and then on that basis it will proceed to one of 24 landing sites and right at that point just before it lands uh, where when it's at about 150 meters it will actually look at the details in terms of the boulders the craters and if it finds that the area is not suitable for landing it will take its own decision and move about by about 150 meters uh, it has the ability to move about 150 uh, meters uh, uh, um, uh, along track as well as across track right. to find a zone which is less uh, cluttered with boulders and crat- uh, craters and it will then land Right now, so we've also seen that much of what the Chandrayaan three does is autonomous. Why is that so? Because you know the communications from the Earth takes time. It takes about two seconds, and uh, you two seconds are too precious. Uh, you know when you are trying to control a craft. So the craft has to be autonomous, and this is not the first time that uh, we have got an autonomous craft. Mangalyaan was also such an autonomous craft. It can take decisions on its own. and that's where the artificial intelligence comes in all right well, so every millisecond is crucial of course so thank you so much for joining us on the show with your inputs on this